Hello everyone. Today we will start arrays. In last class we finished string handling. So we will be looking into arrays. There are two algorithms associated with arrays in AS syllabus. And uh, those arrays algorithms are linear or serial searching and bubble sorting. So we will be discussing arrays. Let us start. So we have finished data types, we have finished string handling, and now we are starting with part three arrays. We will have two types of arrays, single dimension and two dimension arrays. And I am going to include arrays based on uh, user defined types as well. I am going to include arrays based on record types or user defined types. So let us start. So, to understand arrays, you will have to first understand what arrays are in terms of their purpose and how they are created, how they are held in the memory. And then we will see that what are the implementations of arrays and all. There is a term called data structure. Data structure is a term that means means of accessing, holding, and keeping data in computer memory. Means of keeping, accessing, and managing data in computers, memory, whatever. It is all about having the data in the memory and make it available and update it whenever it is required to. So until now, let's say we had variables. Let's say we have a variable X and it is being held in one computer's dedicated memories area. So whenever you assign something like x is equal to 5, this 5 goes in here. And if you like to assign another value, this 5 in memory will be replaced by 8. For this very nature that every time you assign a value to it, the previous value is replaced by the new value, if we call it variable. What if we like to save data which is connected 
and it is undesirable to create different variables for their data. For example, I would like to hold information for a student. So I would like to have a student ID, a student name, a student class, a student address, So sometimes I like to have data for a student names several times. So there might be a different scenarios. First scenario is I need to keep related information in the computer's memory in one place. Second scenario is that I need to keep same sort of information for so many students, again, in the memory in accessible way. So let's first talk about this scenario. Let's say I would like to keep the name of 10 students. So the first thing that comes to mind will be, let's make a student name one, a student name two, a student name three, a student name four, different variables with different numbers in them. So it is fine until the number is controllable. Let's say these are five or 10 or 15 students. What if it is 100 students? How would you able to manage all 100 variables together? Okay. Think about declaration of 100 variables, think about initialization of 100 variables, think about inputting data to 100 variables, think about outputting data from 100 variables, think about searching 100 variables. These all five operations will become very, very, very difficult to handle since the code will be exponentially increased and will become with the increment in the code lines, it will become more inefficient. So the best way to hold the data is this way. Tell computer that I would like to keep data in consecutive memory with indexes in it. All right. How would you handle it? I'll name this whole thing a student name. And I will refer to one of the location by having a subscript on top of it. That is easy, but what the heck is this thing? How we create it, how we will handle it, how we will manage the subscripts. So first of all, you need to understand having a variable is having one value at one location. One value at one location, one value at one location, one value at one location. And these all locations are basically not present adjacent to each other. They are all scattered in the memory. They are different variables. So they have got no connection whatsoever. They are all different, different from each other. They will be treated separately when, be, when are being declared, when are being initialize when I'm being searched for searching is another heck of a work that you will be performing over different variables if they are having the same nature data. So the answer is this data structure, this data structure. This data structure is called array. 
So this is another data structure which enables us to hold multiple values in a consecutive memory location. It is available with one declaration. It is initialized with a loop. It can be searched with a loop. It can be populated or inputted data to it with a loop. And it can be actually used easily with least number of lines for any operation required. Okay, so this is what array is. Now, how do we declare and how do we use it? Basically what happens, let's say I want to create an array for English scores. So I will be basically describing a name first that is an identifier English score. Then after the colon, I will be telling that this is an array which will start from location one and it will be ending at location five. And the type of the array will be integer. Yes, instead of colon over here, we will rather be using off and we will be using colon over here. This is a different declaration than what we do for the variable. So basically, system will see that what is this data type and what is the size of an integer in the computer's memory and then how many do we like to have in the computer's memory multiply this number of locations with the byte and finds the total number of bytes going in the memory looking for 20 consecutive bytes naming them english score then dividing them into five different locations, numbering every single location as per this and making it ready to be used by you using statements like English score at index 3 is equal to 50. So this 50 will essentially go to this location. Now this is called an array, a single column array, a single dimensional array. All right. So this is the declaration in pseudocode. Now there are different terms attached. Number one, this is index. This is lower bound. This is upper bound. This is index and collectively the index and its data is called element. The location, the index and data is called element and when we are using indexes inside the brackets, we call it subscripts. We call it what? Subscript. Now these four terms, five terms, are actually required to be understood thoroughly because we are going to refer to them very frequently. All right, 
Now the question comes that why do we call it single dimensional array? You see, there are two dimensions, x and y. If our array is just a single column and it can improve, it can increase its size in one direction, this is said to be single dimensional array. or S D array. Now, how do we actually create this array? How do we actually perform operations over this array? Let's see how. So let's take the same array, our English score and create it. Declare English score as an array will start from lower bound one, will end at upper bound five. The type will be integer. Let's initialize it. initialize this single dimensional array. What is the upper bound of this array five? So we will initialize it with a single loop. Most welcome Ali Tawkir. I hope that these lectures are helping you. It will help you to achieve uh, good results as well. Okay, so how do we initialize single dimensional array? All we have to do is to run a loop. Let's say I, I make I for index, will go from lower bound to upper bound, which is five. All right, so one, two, five. Now, I'll be like English score, as we all know that an integer is initialized at zero. We will be using this I as subscript and we will be assigning zero to it. And then we use next. So this is a sim single simple code line. So now this I will be substituted with its current value. If I is one, this will become English score one. So let's say if this array is created in computer's memory, one, two, three, four, and five. When the I will be one, this will become zero. When I will become two, this will become zero. When I will become three, this will become zero means English score three is zero, English score four is zero, English score five is zero. And that is how this array English score will be initialized all locations to zero. Okay, so this is initialization. So you see, instead of this five elements array. If I would have five variables and I will be assigning five values to them, I would have to write five different statements. English, English score one is equal to zero, English score two is equal to zero. And ultimately, if I would have 50, I would have to write 50 statements to initialize 50 variables. So this is basically a salvation. So any of the array, which is single dimension, any of the array, which is single dimension, can be initialized with few lines and a loop. All right, so now what if we like to populate it? 
populate a single dimensional array. Again, you would have to run a loop for i is equal to 1 to 5 input score and assign that score to subsequent English score array location. Next. So you see, the loop will start working. It will ask for the input of the score and it will then assign Ali is cord to Takedo, charging up is charging up charging up All right. So good, thank you. We will run this loop. We will input one score and we will assign that score to the subsequent ith location or the index of the array. You see, whenever, whenever there's a question for updating arrays with inputs, the question will be in a way that it will be asking you to take inputs for the whole array and basically to fill the whole array. That is why we call this operation populate, fill the whole array with the inputs. There are questions which basically ask you for the assignment statements for the particular location in the array, that is fine. But when it comes to algorithm and uh, population, so most of the question will be asking to fill the whole array by inputting in a loop. Now, second question is most of the times that we can input directly to the array location. That is also fine. That will do the same as this part. But the thing is that somehow whenever I see marking schemes, uh, it becomes obvious that uh, there are separate marks, separate one mark for input and then assigning to the subsequent array location. All right. So now what will, what will happen that when I will be one, the score that is entered will go to English score one. When I will be two, the entered score will go to English score two location. When I'll be three, it will go to English location. English score three location. Walaikum salam was there. So when you were there, I was teaching there, I believe, in Nixer back in 2016. Okay. Did I teach you the, or you were with another teacher there? Now, after population, you might like to search for the array. You might like to treat the array. You might like to output the array. So let's first See what are the outputs? How do we output from the array? So again, this is very much same. All you have to do is to write a loop and output all the elements of the array. This output will then grow and it will be used more or less the same way for searching. So searching is easy. What in searching actually happens that before running this output loop, what we do, we ask the user for the value that needs to be searched and we run the loop the same way as we do output but we actually match every array element with the required value if it does not match we don't 
we actually do not uh, output it if it does we just output it so in that case it looks like that we are searching otherwise there is no other way searching the array this is called serial searching so first let's learn how to output the array so again we would have a loop for i is equal to one two five and we will output every single english score element at location i and next so this is it the whole array will be output now the best thing about arrays you can observe now instead of if let's say if instead of five you have uh, Oh, good to hear from you, uh, Uzair. So you were my student. So let's catch up on uh, WhatsApp. Let's talk about your stories after schools. So I hope to get a message from you tonight. All right. So what basically happens Let's say if instead of five, we have 50 students. All we would have to do when declaring, uh, declaring the array is to make it 50 rather than five. 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 So in all of the operations, whether it is input, whether it is output, whether it is searching, whether it is declaration, the amount of work as far as the number of lines are concerned to write the code will remain the same. I told you earlier, if you keep separate variables for separate values, welcome Uzair. In that case, what will happen if you have got 50 variables, you would have to declare 50 variables. You would have to initialize 50 variables. You would have to input in 50 variables. You would have to output 50 variables. And if that number still grows, you would have to put more lines. Lengthy code, inefficient code, searching is impossible. And maintaining that code will be not possible in, in any case. So this is what we call single dimensional array. Why single dimensional? It has got one column and if, if it grows, it grows in Y dimension. Now, two dimensional arrays. Or basically I told you that there might be two possibilities when we like to store light linked data in an array or we like to hold different values together in an array now first let's discuss the array which is said to be two dimensional and then we see how do we create an array that might have different type of columns now 2d array What does it mean 2D? 2D means that you have got two directions, X and Y, and now you have got more than one columns that if grow, they can grow X direction. If they grow, they can grow Y direction. So this is said to be two dimensional array, 2D array, two dimensional array. All right, two dimensional array. Now, how to declare a two dimensional array and what shape does it take in computer's memory? That is something very important to understand. Now, declare, let's say I want to keep Ten students data
for five subjects. I would like to keep the instance data. Data as in there is score, English is score. Sorry, uh, there is score in five subjects. I would like to keep 10 students data in five subjects. So let's say the row is the student and the column is the subject. So this is basically the shape I would like my two dimensional array to take one row, one student, two student, three student and four and five students. One, two, three, four, five. And then I would like to have four, sorry, five different subjects. Subject one, two, three, four, five. I would like to keep all five subjects score for 10 students. So I would have another five lines here. Six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So this is said to be two dimensional. Why two dimensional? Now it has got 10 students and columns are basically representing subject for each student. Ali, I don't get your question before will be this week or next week. What do you mean by that? Please elaborate. Now, the name of this particular array, let's say a student scores. All right. So I will declare a student scores. I will first tell about the number of rows. Number of rows is basically the number of students. So it will go from 1 to 10 and then number of columns. It goes from 1 to 5. Now this is basically the norm. Whenever we declare or we use two dimensional arrays, rows always come first and then column rows always come first and then column all right if you swap these two if you exchange these two values then we would have trouble all right you will lose your marks and then this is one of the shoe with the two dimension array that from the first row to the last row, last column, all data types are the same. We cannot have different data types for different columns or different rows. So we would have to choose for a data type that suits best for all the rows and all the columns. Okay, so this is basically the declaration statement for an array that has got 10 rows that we are treating as the number of students and five columns that we are treating as five subjects. So what we are going to hold in it, we are going to hold five different scores for five different subjects per student. So this is a student number one, he would have or she would have a score of the first subject here and then second, the third, the fourth and the fifth. That is how we basically declare. Declare a student score, first we have to tell how many rows. As per the scene, I told you that rows will come always first whenever we are dealing with two dimensional array and then columns. <coughs> and the type of all, all, all of the elements in two dimensional array would be in teacher. Now, the question is, what is an element? Element is every box that you have here. 
this is an element this is an element and this is an element and how do we address these elements very simple if we are going to go hold five over here i be like student scores 2 comma 2 you see row 2 column 2 i told you that rows always show first row 2 column 2 okay so this is basically 5 if i want to address this one row 6 student 6 column 3 subject 3 so i be like student scores 6 comma 3 is equal to 15 so 15 goes there and similarly you can guess this is row 8 column 4 so we actually show which row and which column we would like to place data on and this is basically the element so this is the declaration now let's start with initialization for initialization, we are basically going to use a technique we call nested loop. What does it mean nested loop? Most probably before uh, session, I'll start next month today. I will be starting and finishing it uh, in April. As far as this mock at BCCG, <laughs> I will look into it. I'll look into it. But you need to come and identify yourself that who are you. Then I'll talk about it. Okay. Initialization of 2D array. This is how we have declared it and created it in the memory. We are going to use nested loop. You see, there might be count-based loop, there might be condition-based loop, but since the number of rows and columns, since the number of rows and columns is basically uh, predecided, it is always a good idea to use count-based loop as in for next. Now, nested loop will be something like this for row is equal to 1 to 10 and for column is equal to 1 to 5. So what does it mean row 1 to 10 and column 1 to 5? This means that for every outer count, there is a complete cycle of inner count for every row, all columns. The loop inside will run completely from first to last, from lower bound to upper bound for every outer count. What does it mean? It means that if I put student scores row comma column is equal to zero and then i put next column over here and then next row over here this will be something which means that when one row will change all columns in that row from column one till five will become zero. Means when the when the system encounters, when VB encounters. All right, all right, Muhammad Uzefa, uh, you met me today. Good, good, good. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. I cannot basically, you see, I need to prepare you people for. Uh, good examination so the paper will not be overall tough or overall easy it will be a mixed thing and uh, basically a better paper is always the one which tries every sort of students 
So don't you worry. If you will study, you will be benefited. Now, for every row, all column. Let's say I'm going to execute this code. First of all, I would have row. When the loop will start, row will be one. And after making row one, system will enter column. So for first loop, it will become student scores row comma column means the student scored one comma one. The student score one comma one will become Sat paper kam hoga bite abito schools kam in pale karunga conduct or pirme aplogoga karunga most probably aplogo kam in karunga conduct around the first week of April. One comma one. So if it is student scores row comma column zero, one comma one will come will become zero over here. Then next column will send the loop back to four column. And this time column will become two. So this will become one comma two. Then we would have this element become zero. Similarly, then column will become three, then four, then five. And we will have one comma three, one comma four, one comma five. You see, row is not changing. For outer count, for every outer count, there is a complete cycle of inner counts. Yes, it will be Ibrahim. So for every row, all columns, row does not get changed. Once all columns are initialized, now the inner loop finishes, then it gets out and next row will start. Now row will become two. And for row two, again, we would have one, two, three, four, five. So this time it would be two comma one, two comma two, two comma three, two comma four, two comma five. So you can see they all will become zero. So this way, as I said, for every outer count, there is a complete cycle of inner count. It simply means for every outer row, for every row, all columns. For every row, all columns. So that is the initialization of 2D array. All right. Since the type of all of the elements of the array is same, since the type of all the elements of the complete array is same, we can run loops within loops. All right, so this is row, comma, column. Now, this is initialization. Let's take input. Populate the array. So now for row is equal to one to ten for column is equal to one to five. You take input for score one first score of the subject assign that to the element next column and next row. So 
system will ask for five scores for the first student and it will assign those scores to the first row of the array for all five subjects and then next row next student then next then next then next there might be two ways doing it well the second one will not be as efficient as this one but this might be another way let's say for a student is equal to 1 to 10 input score 1 input score 2 input score 3 input score 4 input score 5 and then assign these five scores to five columns of a student one so a student scores the student number one let's say if this loop will be one comma one then a student scores student comma two column a student scores a student comma third column then a student scores student comma four column then student scores student comma fifth column so score one goes to the first column of the student one then score two goes to second column of the student one then score three then score four and then score five and then next student well Essentially, the two of these uh, particular algorithms will do the same. They will not be different. They will be doing the same. Only the efficiency of code is better with nested loops rather than a single loop. So this is also possible that you take for every student, you take five inputs for five different scores and assign them to the subsequent columns for that particular one student that is all fine they both work the same way but the most efficient one will have here nine or if you have a challenge then basically hello Ashina. Now, so this is population and similarly same way we will output it. So this is two dimensional array. You see more focus in exam questions for two dimensional array will be for the tracing rather than writing programs two dimensional arrays are basically important for the reason that they appear the most for tracing all right rather than for writing programs yes they will ask you to write programs for two dimensional array that is also common but the most common activity is to trace a table so sorry trace a code which is basically holding two dimensional arrays now there is another aspect what you have just noticed for this two dimensional array over here is that all the columns in this two dimensional array had the same data type 
So what if I like to replicate a file record in the array where when file ID would be integer, name would be string, class would be string, fee will be, let's say, um, currency, age will be integer, is fee paid will be uh, boolean. So what if I like to keep separate columns for separate data types? And the whole thing looks like a two-dimensional array. Means what if I like to have an array with every different column of different type? How would I do that? You see, with this traditional single dimensional and two dimensional array, it is impossible. But there is a new thing that got introduced in AS syllabus this year for 9618, and that is record data type or user defined type. Record data type or user defined. In that case, let's say I would like to keep the whole record of the student, whole record as in a student ID, student class, a student name, a student address, a student fee. I might have different, different, different uh, items for related items, by the way, it means they are for one student in one row. And there I, I, I would like to have several rows, it means I would like to have several students having data of different types for every student like it appears in the file. But until now, the restriction was that all columns should be of the same data type over here. So how we will achieve it? First, we need to realize that what sort of related data we will like to hold together. Let's say I want to hold a student ID, a student name, a student age, a student class, a student fee, and is fee paid. Is fee paid. I would like to have one, two, three, four, five, six data items for every student and I would like to have an array of it. How would I do that? With the preceding ways, two ways that we have discussed with one, di one dimensional array, single dimensional array, it is completely impossible to hold multiple items. As we know that every single column will be for one value then. So single dimensional array is not possible. In two dimensional array, since we like to have this as integer, this as string this as a teacher this as a string this as currency this as uh, uh, this as currency and this as boolean we cannot do that so we will create a record data type out of it we'll create a record data type out of it how we will do that we will create a record data type I named it a student record and then in this student record I mentioned that I would like to have a student ID so I will be declaring it declare a student ID as integer Declare a student name as a string. Declare a student age as a teacher. Let's say we would like to have age in points as well. So let's make it real. Declare a student class as a string. Declare student fee as currency and declare is fee paid as boolean 
Now remember, this is a type. This is not itself the data structure. <clears throat> we will have to create a data structure out, out of this type. This is also called user defined type. As in U D N T. We can use this type to create a single variable like this. Declare a student one as a student record. And then how will I be able to access all the types, all the data inside the student one? You need to understand that this is a composite data type. A composite data type is the one which is created out of other data types. It means it is holding much more data than one value in its tummy. It is having more values. Usually one variable would have one value in it, but this one variable would have so many values in it. So how would I access, let's say the student ID, I will be like a student one dot a student ID is equal to three. A student one dot a student name is equal to Zafar. A student one dot a student fee is equal to 400. All right. So this is how we access the data inside a rapid data type. and access it, use it, whatever we do. So this is a single variable. What if I like to have an array of it? And I would like to have an array for this record, this UDT user defined type, this one, the student record. I might have a student one, a student two, a student three, a student four, all would have their relative data inside them under one variable name that is super fine. But what if I like to, save several students, so many students together in one array shape. In that, we will call it a single dimensional array. The most different thing is that this is still a single dimensional array because it is declared as a single dimensional array because one variable has all of it inside it in its tummy we won't have to actually put in any effort to create multiple columns for that. We will just describe one array, let's say declare students as an array which goes from one lower bound to five upper bound of a student record. Now you see what? You will have an array which is technically single dimensional, but it's every dimension would have so many things in it. It would have several data items in one dimension, but if we depict it graphically, you see what? We have five students and we would like to have a student ID student name, the student age, the student class, a student fee, and is fee paid.
all right now you see these columns are not being numbered they are being named only these rows are being numbered unlike over here where every column was being numbered in two dimensional arrays with udt it is only single dimensional but every column has a number associated number 2 every column would have a different data type as it was mentioned in record uh creation of this record data type okay now if i like to have data of student number 3 updated i'll do that students three dot student id see every single index or subscript would have student id name age student class student fee is fee paid in its dummy it is not the second dimension as far as this declaration is concerned rather it's like this variable a row is like this variable student 1 which have everything inside it because it is made out of this student record data type or user defined type so i can move one in it so what is different there are two things different number one columns do not have numbers columns have names columns do not have same data type they have different data types and the most important thing is this is single dimension array and every dimension would have all these data types inside its dummy because it is made up of uh, made, made up of a udt user defined type or type record type so if i like to change the age so i be like students Three dot student age is equal to nineteen. That is how it works. All right, that is how it works. So this is a new thing that would have related questions this year. Since it was never there, you would not see any past paper question related to this type of array. But yes, you would have. such type of arrays now let's see how do we actually achieve it using visual basic Let's go to GitHub. At GitHub, we would have arrays. Array codes for AS. single dimensional array basics we have got here the code uh there is a, a little difference as usual between the pseudo codes and the visual basic ones
you can see I have declared an array of five locations name as names array and the type is a string so this is the declaration in visual basic rest is uh, almost the way it was described earlier so for initialization i'll run a loop of a from one to five and i will initialize every single array location to null since it is a string it will be nullified and then i'll populate i'll run the code from a to if for a one to five and i'll enter one value and i'll assign it to subsequent value in the array names array if a is one it will go to one if a is two it will go to two and then i'll use the same thing as i would do for output a single variable for the array but this time it is placed in a loop and i am using the value of a as the index or subscript for this uh, array when a will be one names array will be names array one will be output when a is two names array two will be output if name uh, a is three names array three will be output and then comes searching uh, let's hold for a single execution of this program until we start with the uh, two dimension array or searching okay so let's run this code let's see what happens you see it is asking for a name one so i say zafar ali ahmed Ibrahim and Josefa. These are five names. You see, these five names were being taken and populated in the array, and then over here in this loop, in this particular loop, all the values were being taken as input. So when the loop works, it says enter name one, enter name two, enter name three, enter name four, and take that name and put in the array at the position which is mentioned by this name or the, this number, the index. Okay. Now, Afterwards, this output loop works and all the values are output them here. Since they are now in array, they are output. Okay, so declaration was done. The input was well taken. The input is then output. Okay, and before the array was being populated, it was initialized as well. This is very simple code. Now let's see. How it works for two dimension arrays. So basic 2D array practices. Remember my handle over GitHub as usual, there is Zach on where. Everywhere my handle is Zach on where. Now this is two dimensional array, 
rows and columns we do not have to actually show the lower bound hello we only tell visual basic the upper bound then initialization as i said that we can initialize using uh, basically an easier thing since all the elements in the area are integer so everything will be initialized to zero for every row all columns will be initialized and then when all rows are done it will get out and then populate so we can populate array easily so, <laughs> i have uh, commented it out for the reason that uh, populating all elements in the array when there are five rows and 10 columns it will become 50 inputs so it is basically hard to populate everything this way so we have actually initialized it oh sorry i mean commented it and then i ran a process so that all the elements of the array can be uh, populated so what i have done i have uh, actually taken every column for every row and i have stored the value of the row multiplied by that column okay and then i'll output everything let's see how it works basically you can see that this is one row this is a second row this is a third row this is a fifth row this is uh, one two three four five five rows and then every row has got 10 columns okay so that is the output that is how two dimension array work So these are arrays and uh, this is how the array is practiced. Now let's solve a few of the past paper questions and see if they work properly for you. Actually, the most important thing about arrays is that you would have to actually practice as many questions as possible for arrays from the past papers. Okay. Doing that will actually make you good with it hold on let me fetch In pseudocode, it is always large brackets, square brackets, and uh, in visual basic, it is uh, uh, parentheses or round bracket that you call it. So it is necessary that we use box brackets, square brackets. Okay.
you see questions of array will not be actually limited to arrays only question of arrays will be around a different task different thing but they will be using arrays so the focus of those questions which are holding up array would be not the array itself but would be the process that requires arrays to be used Now this is the tough part. Array themselves are not actually very difficult. Use and implementation of the arrays is actually challenging. <clears throat> so let's solve as many questions as possible and then I'll refer to a video of the arrays where I have solved many questions. सर इमेजेस एरे की फॉर्म में स्टोर होते हैं हो सकते हैं लेकिन होते नहीं
ओके नाउ इट सेज डिक्लेयर स्टूडेंट ग्रेट एज एरे फ्रॉम वन टू फाइव ऑफ कैरेक्टर दिस इज अ सिंगल डायमेंशनल एरे दैट इज बेसिकली ऑफ कैरेक्टर डेटा टाइप Declare n as integer, x as integer, n is equal to three, x is equal to a student grade n. So use the correct technical term to explain the meaning of one to five. In this pseudo code. And this is basically lower bound This is upper bound. and this is a single dimension use the correct technical term to complete the following statement integer n is used as the subscript to student grade now a 2d array picture contains data representing a bitmap image each element of the array represents one pixel of the image the image is gray scale and encoded where the value of the each pixel range from 0 representing black to 255 as we know that 2 to power 8 is 256 means the smallest number would be 0 and the largest number would be 255 now with intermediate value representing different levels of gray the following is an example of an image and the corresponding data values for the picture array 
so now this is a bitmap uh, visualization and the number for each and every color of gray every shade of gray will be from 0 to 255 so over here it is 240 over here it is 10 it goes on and then it becomes 240 then this is 80 then this is 80 and corresponding values are shown so it is actually very important to visualize whatever the question they ask if you won't visualize it properly you will never be able to answer it so this is a better part to first spend a, a, a minute or two to visualize what actually will be the output how it will be saved how it is saved in the memory how we will be tackling with it so visualization actually gives you an idea of the answer beforehand now in pseudocode the array is declared as this this is two dimensional array these are rows means one two three four five six seven and eight and these are columns as in one two three four five six seven and eight of integer they all are integers now a function lighten a function lighten is required to lighten the image lighten an image may cause it to burn out an image is said to be burned out if any pixel is set to the maximum value of 255 what does it mean the maximum value of 255 it means that when you enhance the, the color if it goes beyond 255 it will be burned out first thing you have to take care of it that it does not go beyond 255 since one array is representing one array element is representing what a single byte which means from 0 to 255 it goes from two uh, it goes beyond 255 you would have to bring it back to 255 the function lighten will increase the value of each pixel by 10 percent so we can easily write for row is equal to one two eight and for column is equal to one to eight as well and then you would have to actually increase the value by ten percent so you be like the name of the array is picture so you be like picture row comma column is equal to picture row comma column multiply by 1.1 1.1 1. 1. 1. by 1.1 1. 1 and assigning it back to this will increase the number by 10 percent now increase the value of each pixel by 10 percent return true if the result image is burnout so this is basically a function function is name of the function is lighten and it returns what boolean Okay, it returns what? Boolean. Okay, now return true if the resultant image is burnout. So now we would have a variable, let's say, we will name it burnout we will make it false so we will have to do two things number one first if picture row comma column 
is greater than 255, then picture row comma column is equal to 255 because one element cannot go beyond 255. And then we would have to make burnout true. And if next column, next row, out and end function. All right. Write pseudocode to implement lighten. Assume that array picture is a global variable. Means that this, you don't have to actually receive it as a parameter. It is already there. It is in the computer's memory and it is global. So it is there. It is very much filled in and it is actually available all the times. So you run this function. It returns a Boolean value. We have got a flag called burnout. It is initially set to false. Then we run to check every single row and every column. So for row is equal to one to eight, for column is equal to one to eight, then picture row comma column. We have to increase the the value is increased by 10% as asked by them over here. And then we check that after the increment, if the value has uh, gone beyond 255, it is now bigger than 255, it is greater than 255, then we will bring it back to 255 and we will make this flag true. And then we run column by column in every row throughout the image. Once we get out, we will return the burnout. If there will be no burnout after the change, the burnout flag will remain burnout. It's false. And if there will be a single change after which this, the number would have grown beyond 255, burnout would have already become true, and then we will return true. All right. Now, a function process marks is required to analyze test marks for a class of students. There are 20 students in the class. A mark between 0 to 100 is given. The mark for class are stored in an array mark which has 20 elements. The array is passed to the function as parameter. The function will output message stating the average marks, the highest marks, and the function will return the subscript of the highest marks. Okay, so let's say we have got an array. One, two, three, four, it goes until 100. The name of the array is mark. The type of the array is integer and it is filled. And it is receiving what? It is receiving the array as basically uh, the what do we call it? Uh, parameter. All right. And then and find the highest and the average and all. Okay, now this is a function, the name of it receives the array, the name of the array is mark. Now it's up to you that how would you like to this array to be received 
uh, standard way of receiving uh, array as parameter is to declare it as an array. Array 1 to 20, this is 20, sorry. And of a teacher. This is the parameter and this function returns subscript, means it returns integer. All right, so this is the function header. Function procedure uh, process marks, it receives an array in parameter array, which will have 20 elements of integer and this function also returns an integer. The mark for the class are stored in an array, okay? The array is passed to the function as parameter. The function will output the message stating average height and weight. So now we will have to run. This is a single dimension array for i is equal to one to 20. We will have one variable highest that we will set to zero, initialize to zero and then we check that if marks i is greater than highest and then we would have to have subscript as well highest subscript because we will be sending it back as the value of the function or the function returns the highest value subscript so if marks i is greater than highest, then highest is updated. Highest is equal to marks i. Sure, 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 Saad. And then we update the subscript as well. Subscript is equal to i because we have to note down that where the highest marks were present at what array location. So if the element of the array is highest than the previous highest, then the highest will be updated and the subscript of that particular location will be saved in subscript variable. All right. And if, and then we have to have a total, total is equal to total plus because we need to output a message as well. Total is equal to total plus marks I. And this goes for 20 times next to I. Once you get out, you will have to actually formulate this particular message that you will output. So you be like output the average mark is then you have to put average over here because we have to find average as well. Average is equal to total divided by 20. So we output average plus and the highest mark is then we would have to concatenate it with highest. All right, with highest. And then we return subscript. Then function ends. Okay, so we receive the values which are being sent as array in mark array. We return integer of the highest value subscript, and we have initialized subscript to zero, highest to zero 
for i is equal to 1 to 20 and we are checking every single location with the previous highest if the locations that are the element is higher than the previous highest then highest will be updated as well as the subscript i i index will be saved into subscript variable once you get out of this if you would have to have total as we would have to find the average and once we get out of the loop we will have to actually find the average average will be total divided by 20 and then we will have to output this message which says that output the average mark is plus average because we will have to substitute this location with the variable value and then and the highest mark is highest which is 76 in this case and over here whatever the value that will be so we have to concatenate we can concatenate with the end and plus both and then we return the subscript because it says that the function returns the subscript of the highest mark that we have updated over here and then the function ends you would have several 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 questions for this array not just to make pseudocode for but to scan it to trace it to dry run it and remember the marks for dry running the code would be higher than the marks allocated for writing the pseudo code so it is actually absolutely necessary for appearing p2 that you should master yourself with arrays okay so this was an introduction of array with couple of questions from the past paper now i am redirecting you to the youtube channel where there are two uh, videos i uploaded earlier and in one of the video i have actually solved more questions for your better understanding so let's see These are two AS arrays, AS arrays, part one of two explanation in linear search. Okay, at AS level, mind it, do search for it. Okay, my channel's name is Zach on Web, Zafar Ali Khan, over here, and the handle is Zach on Web, Zafar Ali Khan, to go look out for it. Okay, and whatever that I have taught today will be fine, will be found over here. And then there is a second part. The second part is basically bubble sort and past paper questions. Okay, in next class, I will do linear search and the bubble sort and couple of more past paper questions, which I will actually handpick for tracing and as well as one of the questions for making another pseudo code form. Okay, so by saying that it is a good idea to practice arrays right away because you see P2 is not a subject that can be learned just before the exam, that can be practiced just before the exam. Coding is something which is nature, it cannot be learned 24 hours or 34, 36 hours before the exam, it is only known to humans if they practice it. If they practice it well, they, they solve past paper question, they understand it better. Because you never know from what angle they'll ask. They will ask you for concept, they will ask you for analyzing their solution, they'll ask you for writing your codes which are said to be implementation so conceptual questions analysis questions and implementation questions these are three different types of question they can ask you for arrays okay and to master all those you would have to actually practice very well all those my students who are at schools or tuitions would have already done these arrays and it is a good idea that they have since they have revised it after revision, they actually find two hours out of their routine and to practice arrays by tracing them from the past papers and all, okay? 
So that's about it for today. And I hope that uh, this would be a good session, a good uh, reminding session, a good revision session. And if there are any questions, please do ask those questions in your respective groups or over the YouTube if you like to. That's about it. I see you Sunday morning with further explanation of uh, arrays and a uh, few more questions from the past papers.